আর সুপ্রিয় চিকিৎসক মন্ডলী আপনাদের সবাইকে আজকের বিডি ফিজিশিয়ান্স এর জন্য একটা ঐতিহাসিক দিনে স্বাগত আজকে আমাদের মাঝে এমন একজন চিকিৎসক জয়েন করেছেন যিনি বাংলাদেশের আসলে একটা ইতিহাসের অংশ আমি প্রথমেই স্যারকে ইন্ট্রোডিউস করাই প্রফেসর ডক্টর হারুনুর রশিদ ফাউন্ডার প্রেসিডেন্ট কিডনি ফাউন্ডেশন ঢাকা বাংলাদেশ আমি একটু স্যার সম্বন্ধে একটু দু এক মিনিট বলে নিতে চাই আসলে শুধু সার্কে নিয়ে ডিসকাশন করেই দুই তিনটা সেশন শেষ করা যাবে আমি একটু যতটুকু না বললেন আমি একটু বলি স্যার বিগেন ক্যারিয়ার ইন নেফ্রোলজি ইন নাইনটিন এইটি ওয়ান জয়েন নেফ্রোলজি টিচার ইন নেফ্রোলজি ইন দ্য আইপিজিএমআর যা বর্তমানে বিএসসি মেমো নামে পরিচিত স্টার্টেড হেমোডাইলাইসিস ইন নাইনটিন এইটি সিক্স এন্ড সিএপিডি ইন নাইনটিন কোর্স Uh, in IPGMR 1996 under Dhaka University, which was on Nephrology MD. He conducted huge number of research work, which is more than 50, 150 plus. And under his guidance, uh, more than 50 students uh, did their MD thesis. In 1998, appointed, appointed as project director to establish NICDU, and become the founder director from 2002 to 2003 period. In 2003, he established Kidney Foundation of Bangladesh and become the founder president. He took active role to frame the Organ Act law in Bangladesh, which passed in parliament in July 1999. He got many national and international award and recognition. এবং আমাদের সাথে আজকে সেশনটা কেয়ার করতে সম্মত হয়েছেন আমাদের একজন ফাউন্ডার অ্যাডমিন প্রফেসর ডক্টর প্রদীপ কুমার দত্ত ইজ এক্স ভাইস প্রিন্সিপাল চিটাং মেডিকেল কলেজ অ্যান্ড এক্স হেড অফ দ্য ডিপার্টমেন্ট অফ নেফ্রোলজি চিটাং মেডিকেল কলেজ আমি আমাদের আজকে চেয়ারপারসন প্রফেসর প্রদীপ কুমার দত্তকে সেশনটা শুরু করার জন্য অনুরোধ জানাচ্ছি থ্যাংক ইউ ডক্টর এসান এটা আমাদের সবাইকে যে স্যারের সেশনে একজন মডারেটার হিসেবে থাকা স্যার আমার ডিরেক্ট শিক্ষক এমডি ডিরেক্ট টিচার ছিলেন স্যার থেকে আমরা নেফ্রোলজিতে আসার অনুপ্রেরণা পেয়েছি এবং স্যার নেফ্রোলজিটা হলো স্যারের একদম হাতের মুঠায় আমরা প্রায় বলতাম যে হাতের মুঠায় যেটা বলে নেফ্রোলজি এটা ছিল স্যারের হাতের মুঠায় স্যারকে ইন্ট্রোডিউস করার বিশেষ কিছু নাই সবাই চিনে বাংলাদেশের ইজ দ্য পায়নিয়ার নেফ্রোলজিস্ট অফ বাংলাদেশ ফাউন্ডার প্রেসিডেন্ট বাংলাদেশ কিডনি ফাউন্ডেশন যেটা আইএসএন এর এখন সিস্টার একটা অর্গানাইজেশন ট্রেনিং সেন্টার হিসেবে স্বীকৃত হয়েছে এটা বিরাট ব্যাপার স্যার আগে আইএসএন এর কাউন্সিলার ছিলেন ভাইস প্রেসিডেন্ট ছিলেন ইজ দ্য টিচার অফ দি টিচার্স মানে স্যারের এখানে স্যারের সাথে থাকা তো স্যার থেকে শিখার যে আরো কত কিছু আছে এটা চিন্তা করা যায় না আমার এমডি ক্লাসের প্রথম ক্লাস ছিল স্যারের এডাল স্টোন লিস্ট আমার এখনো মনে আছে ওইটা শুনে আমার মনে হচ্ছিল যে আসলে তো আমি তো আগে কিছুই জানতাম না রেনার স্টোন্ডি যে এরকম হলো স্যার এটা আমাদের বিরাট সবাই তো যে বিডি ফিজিশিয়ানের স্যারকে রাজি করানো যে একটা গ্লোমালোনাফ্রাইটিসের উপর বলবেন আহ আশা করবো যে উইল এনজয় এন এভরি আজকে যারা অ্যাটেন্ডেন্স যারা করছেন তারাও এনজয় করতে পারবেন এবং নতুন অনেক কিছু শিখতে পারবেন স্যার প্লিজ প্রফেসর হারুন রশিদ লেট আস ওয়েলকাম হিম Thank you. It is indeed a great pleasure for me that I've been invited by the Doctors Forum, Dr. Hassan Khan. I'm very pleased to say that Professor Pradeep Kumar Dutta, the very eminent nephrologist in our country who will chairing this session. And I shall discuss today briefly about the glonephritis and how we can make it diagnosis and manage this group of patients. We know that the kidney is like size of a fist present in the back covering the 11th and 12th ribs in the left kidney and the 12th ribs in the right kidney. It is usually 11 to 12 centimeter in height, 6 to 7 centimeter in breadth, and 3 to 4 centimeter in thickness. And the left kidney is slightly upper than the height of the right kidney because it is pushed easily by the liver. 
Actually, if we do an ultrasonography, we usually found that the ultrasonographists give uh, the size of the kidney, and mostly they say normal size kidney, medium size kidney, small size kidney, and large size kidney. This sometimes it causes confusion to the doctors as well if they could size how, when, and how we can determine the size of the kidney, whether it is a small size or large size, or it is uh, in variable size. One kidney may be small, other can be very large. So I'll discuss this more in detail, but when uh, the these kidneys are easily supplied by the renal artery, the renal artery, which give different branches of the arteries, and ultimately it goes to form the clumps, forming the efferent arteriole and efferent arteriole, which constitute the glomeruli and situated in the peripheral part of the kidney. This is a very important area that is the peripheral part of the kidney because most of the nephron, the filtering membrane, is situated in this peripheral part. And once this kidney arteries clumps together, making efferent and efferent arterioles, then it forming the tubules as well, the proximal tubule, the loop of the Henle and distal tubule, and then major calices, minor calices, major calices, then uh, it form formation of the urine and it passes through the urinary bladder. The most important area is the filtering membrane of the kidney and this being formed by this the glomeruli which constitute of the external cells that is endothelial cell we have many millions of uh, uh, what we call the foramen and the middle cell is the basement membrane is a mesh like structure and in the inner is photocytes or epithelial cells. And whenever the blood flows to the renal artery and returned by the renal vein, the filtration occurs. So if we, if the heart contracts in every systole, it goes, the blood goes to the kidneys and the kidney started filtering and in 24 hours, it filtered about 170 liters of the blood. And of them, most of the this filtering blood come back to the kidney again, about 168 liter, and we pass urine the two liter, that is the waste products of the body. Surprisingly, this filtering membrane form at nine weeks of pregnant during pregnancy. And urine started at 10 to 12 weeks time. And each kidney contain 0.8 to 1.2 million filtering membrane. And this filtering membrane completed by 34 to 36 weeks of pregnancy. So if we consider the total length of these capillaries for all 2 million glomeruli, it will be about 19 kilometer. And this 19 kilometer surface area can easily filter hundreds and thousands of the, that is the blood. The total surface area for all capillaries is 6,000 square centimeter and total surface, filtering surface is 516 square centimeter. All this uh, filtering membrane does not work at one time. So somebody makes some rest and somebody what? And that is why we always say kidney filters 170 liters of blood every day. 
At the same time, it excretes the metabolic waste products from the body as urine. And it secretes essential hormone that is very important because it in the form of renin, which maintain the blood pressure, it manufactures erythropoietin, that is red blood cells, and also it converted vitamin D to vitamin D3 and strengthen the bone and the regular the full fluid balance of the body. <clears throat> I have uh, discussed these things because when you come to the glomerulonephritis or nephrotic syndrome, we have to give much more concern with that of the filtering membrane, that is epithelial cell, endothelial cell, and the basement membrane, that the filtering membrane. Because glomeruli, in fact, the nef nephritis or the nephrotic syndrome, which also affects these three cells at all the times, either by known cause or by unknown cause. The common kidney diseases is, the most of the common kidney disease is glonephritis and nephrotic syndrome in our country. And this, the second commonest cause, diabetic kidney disease, third commonest cause is hypertensive kidney disease. And when this glonephritis or nephrotic syndrome diabetic kidney nephropathy and hypertensive kidney disease process more than three months and does not cure completely, then it turns into a chronic kidney disease. But there are some kidney diseases which is heredofamilial in origin that is also important, but not for glonephritis. So let us start with the glonephritis of the day's topics. This is mostly immunological in origin, about 80% cases, and it has variable treatment and the prognosis. If we consider the immunological in origin, at first we have to remember that if there is a post-streptococcal infection, what we commonly say in as tonsillitis on pyoderma, then this antigen comes through the blood to the kidney and this is called an exogenous antigen. As a result of which the, when exogenous antigen attacks the kidney, then this there is a antibody become active and it attacks to remove the exogenous antigen from the blood or from the body. And if the fight each other to remove the antigen, but when it, does, it is not successful, then it call for complement activation. So therefore, antigen, antibody, complement complexes form, and when this go, and this, when this complex goes to the kidney, it attack the endothelial cell, epithelial cell, and these two mainly, and some stuck by the basement membrane. As a result, there is a leakage of the glomeruli, and this leakage in turn cause the acute inflammation where there is influx of circulating leukocyte, hemodynamic alteration, and as a result, there is a proteinuria hematuria and many of these cells appears and as a result it causes acute glomerulonephritis and when you do not know the this type of antibody or the ex endogenous antigen when we do not know then it becomes more complicated and this complicates what the glonephritis, 80% of the glonephritis, yet today, with the advancement of the medical science, we don't know who are these antibodies are and how to detect these antibodies. That is why treatment is so variable in patients with glonephritis. 
So if there is a sudden appearance of edema of face and body, within two to three weeks time, then it is usually called the AGN or acute glonephritis or nephritic illness. But if this edema is gradually occurred over weeks and months, and there is a edema of the body, legs and abdomen, all body swelled up, it is usually called nephrotic syndrome. But there are some places where there is a no edema, but or, or the occasion for routine examination, there is a slight proteinuria of one to two plus, but there is a detection of high blood pressure. This is another term called isolated proteinuria, or when there is a recurrent blood in the urine without any protein, it is known as recurrent macroscopic or microscopic hematuria. So if we consider the percentage of this illness, sudden appearance of edema of face and body, what we call acute nephritic illness, it is usually 20%. But when we consider the nephrotic syndrome, it is about 70%. And less than 10% is usually with asymptomatic proteinuria and recurrent hematuria, but this varies from country to country. And rapid deteriorating kidney function occurs in most about 5% cases when there is a rapid rise of serum creatinine with hematuria and edema and shortness of breath. It is called rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. So how we to diagnose glomerulonephritis? The diagnosis of glomerulonephritis is very, very easy. And this diagnosis can be made by even by the nurses. We, you do not need a doctor. A medical student is very expert enough to call them what is nephritis, what is glonephritis or nephrotic syndrome. So if we find that the microscope, if we make an albustics or maltistics in a 5 cc of early morning specimen of the urine, the albustics should determine the 1 plus albumin, 2 plus albumin, 3 plus albumin, and 4 plus albumin. The 24 hours urine total protein is not always necessary, but you can estimate roughly with these albustics that if there is a 1 plus albumin, it is less than 1 gram protein in 24 hours. If there is a 2 plus, it is usually 1 to 2 gram. If there is a 3 plus, it is two to three gram, and if there is a four plus, it is more than four gram to even up to 10 gram. So albustics can indirectly also determine, uh, not very accurately, but uh, somewhat accurate that how much protein is leaking and what would be the symptoms. But microscope examination will show you that every glorified is because of leaking of the uh, RBC, you will get plenty of RBC as well, particularly in acute glonephritis and also in case of IgNephropathy and mesangiocapillary glonephritis. But the RBC cast, which is accumulated by the uh, RBC, the protein and the uh, other uh, hyaline all together, get together and can form RBC cast as well. So if you get the RBC cast, if you get the red cell, and if there is acute nephritic illness, immediately you can tell that, that it can be acute chronophritis. But in case of nephrotic syndrome, in, uh, it is RBC can be present in few cases, but not always. But nephrotic syndrome is mainly would be 3 to 4 plus proteinuria and hematuria is occasionally present, but it is not mandatory. Hypertension can be present or may not be present, but we always to see the blood pressure is either normal or not normal. Usually glucose is not absent, the glucose is absent, that is why it is nice to say that it is not a diabetic kidney disease, 
by history you can clearly detect diabetic kidney disease and by checking the blood pressure you can detect also the most important aspect of hypertension which is less than 140 90 millimeter of mercury in case of adult so next investigation is usually once you finish the urine examination which is a mandatory for every patient which is mandatory for every doctors every clinicians that without urine examination do not go to the second investigation the second investigation will be blood for urea creating in electrolyze nowadays we do not do 24 hours urine protein because of cumbersome but it is very accurate with protein creatine ratio and at the same time you can calculate egfr from that of serum creatine level. We should also do serum total protein, albumin, cholesterol. One should know that acute nephritis does not have get enough time to raise the cholesterol synthesis from the liver. As a result, acute nephritis does not usually have that of high cholesterol level. But in case of nephritic syndrome, invariably cholesterol will be high. So, Lipid profile should be done even to differentiate acute nephritis from diet of nephrotic syndrome. As I say that the complement C3, C4 should be low in acute nephritis because the complement is coming to join the antibodies and antigen, anti-nuclear factor may be important in some glonephritis like polyarthritis, nodacha, Wegener granulomatosis, and renal lupus. Anti-DS DNA is always necessary for renal lupus. And ANCA anti-nephrophilic cytoplasmic antibody is very, very important for ANCA-associated glonophritis that what we uh, earlier discussed about, about the rapidly progressive glonophritis. So, we should, in a teaching hospital, should do all these things in a patient with nephritis and nephrotic syndrome so that we could not miss any of these glonephritis, whether it is a renal lupus, whether it is a polyarthritis nodosa, because in many cases, this can remain asymptomatic. Blood for hemoglobin, TC, DC, BTCT, platelet, should be, it always be done that is mandatory for doing a renal biopsy and renal kidney, kidney biopsy is also a very important issue for adult glonephritis, but not in children nephritis. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C should be done routinely because this can be an associated with glonephritis. This can be a cause of glonephritis. <coughs> so it is a cause of glonephritis you need to have uh, do it at uh, the uh, more form of case. Ultrasonograph of the kidney, as I say, whether it is a normal side kidney with pelvic calicial pattern, and whether it is a enlarged kidney, hydronephrosis, or it is a small size kidney. The small size kidney, if the pelvic calicial system is good, then you can go for renal biopsy. But if the pelvic glycel system is distorted and it is really 8.5 or less than 8, then you must have to cautious for kidney biopsy. The kidney biopsy is done usually in the periphery of the kidney. As I say, that it is the place where 100% glomeruli is, will be over there. So with ultrasonography guided biopsy, is most important and we can have the three tissues one in the formalin for preservation goes for hemotaxlin eosin and pastain and and another is that you can take it in the sterile gauze to go for the immunofluorescence technique and if we practice the electron microscopy it can it should go there the slices is very important for the microscopic examination. So it should be of two to three micron. If it is more than three micron, then histologists will not very happy 
to give a very accurate report of the histopathology. So this is a normal kidney where you can see the epithelial cell, you can see the endothelial cell, and you can also the apparent arterial juxtaglomerular apparatus. So these are the histologists will say more accurately, but you can find out some of the endothelial cell, some of the mesangial cell. Remember, the mesangial cell is three to seven in number in each kidney in the normal glomeruli. But when there is a mesangial proliferative glomerular fetish, it will be hundreds of cells or more than that. So if we go for a general management uh, and specific management, let's talk about the general management because you know, when we uh, work in a, in a district hospital or in a village or in rural population, nephrotic syndrome will come over there. There we deem a patient with edema and they can easily do the heat test of, that is obsolete nowadays. So albustics will be more cheaper for them and all of them should keep a albustics or baltic stick with them. And if they found the albumin is there, protein is leaking, then edema is present, please restrict the fluid. Do not say that 24 hours urine output plus 500 cc. This will confuse everybody and also to the patient. <clears throat> you just restrict the fluid to one liter per day as long as the edema is present. Once edema disappears, then gradually you can improve the fluid restriction. But as long as the edema is present, never say that 24 hours you did not put plus 500 cc that will never go, never give treatment to the edematous patient diuretic the most of the diuretics is nowadays and everywhere is a loop diuretics fusamide bumotanide these are the two most important diuretics for edema in patient with nephrotic syndrome it does not work very nicely because when serum albumin is low, the diuretics does not work because diuretics needs to conjugate with human uh, serum albumin and then they can work. Even if acute nephritis is very important to give loop diuretics because by giving loop diuretics, you can reduce the high blood pressure as well. You can uh, minimize the edema and the patient will be uh, very helpful and the patient will be recovered very quickly. In case of acute nephritis, you usually do not need to give antibiotic until and unless there is acute tonsillitis or pyoderma. The control of hypertension, AC and ERB, is a, it will be a little bit conf confusion to the rural population mm -hmm. if they do not could not estimate the serum creatine level, I will not be encouraged them to give AC or ARB even a, if they could not determine the electrolyte level. So electrolyte level determination is a mandatory and serum creatine is also a mandatory to give AC or ARB. But calcium channel blocker, we can use it but remember that the calcium channel blocker in the form of amlodipine will not be a very good drug because it, it does retain the fluid and edema might not disappear too soon. However, vasodilator, beta blocker, all is available. So we, your choice can be other drugs as well. <clears throat> About the... Uh, uh, we know that the when there is the edema, salt will accumulate over there. So all the nephrologists and doctors should restrict salt. Diet with a high or normal protein should be given in proteinuric patient. That is always helpful, better, because they always suffer from low albumin label in the serum. High protein diet, I will encourage to give high protein diet in the form of egg white or even some egg 
with the EOLA portion as well to increase the calorie level. Low fat and normal carbohydrate is always useful as dietary protein. For specific management is usually the cornerstone of the treatment of nephrotic syndrome or glonephritis is corticosteroid. Without corticosteroid, one could not fill to treat glonephritis in adult and even in children. The next drug is the commonly used is cyclophosphamide, which is very important for our country because it is cheaper. It uh, can go with all uh, nephrotic syndrome with specific origin. Chlorambucil is not used in Bangladesh and it is the Italian study they prefer to use chlorambucil. But uh, newer drugs which has appeared is cyclosporin, tacrolimus, mycophenolic, mufetil, and reduximab. <laughs> These are the very important tablet which is available. So let us go to that treatment. I, I will take a few minutes to discuss this treatment here. When you go for a uh, histological pattern, usually it is divided by the histopathologist, the glonephritis which have proliferative changes. That is a lot of cell over there. That is whether it is endothelial cell, epithelial cell, uh, mesangial cell. But there are glonephritis or nephrotic syndrome which is non-proliferative changes. They do not have any cell. For example, minimal change disease, there is no cellular proliferation, but there is a fusion of the food process and the leakage of proteinuria. And focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, also similar to that of minimal change, but there is a segmental sclerosis. Sclerosis is over there. And membranous nephropathy, there is no proliferation. But this is a thickness of the basement membrane. But there is no proliferation of epithelial cell or endothelial cells. Fortunately, these non-proliferative changes, which is efficient, are for corticosteroid use. That is the very important issue. If we know that it is a minimal change, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, membranous nephropathy, will be very happy because they will be responded with steroid or steroid with cyclophosphamide or steroid with azathioprine or steroid with rituximab or sorry rituximab alone or steroid with cyclophosphamide or other newer drugs like uh, mycophenolate mofetil. But mycophenolate mofetil is very expensive. The secondary disorder is what I oh, say the adrenal lupus, that is also because of secondary cause. It is proliferative, but it responded to steroid. But the primary kidney, idiopathic kidney disease is very rarely respond to steroid. For example, IgA nephropathy respond to steroid only in 50% cases. IgN, IgM nephropathy respond to the very prolonged use of uh, steroids. <clears throat> Mesangioproliferative glonephritis, they do not respond with steroid. Crescentic glonephritis and member crescentic glonephritis respond with steroid along with cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate mofetal and membranoproliferative glonephritis. The treatment is uh, very difficult to do but low steroid for a prolonged use may have some effect. The so post infection gen, gen glonephritis related to hepatitis B and C, systemic vasculitis, these all are proliferative drug-induced GN, Alport syndrome, diabetic nephropathy. They are not usually response to steroid except drug-induced glonephritis. <clears throat> so this is a form of acute post-streptococcal glonopritis. You can see the tonsil, you can see the pyoderma, 
and if we consider this post-tetracal nephritis from normal kidney to that of post proliferative nephritis, you can see that huge amount of poly proliferation of epithelial cell, endothelial cell, messenger cell is there. And the slide you show the immunophorescence, we can see the deposition of IgG and complement, IgG, IgA, IgM and complement deposition. You can see clearly over there and on electron microscopy, you can see the humps, that is the antibody deposition. <clears throat> so all the three, that is the proliferation of cells, the immunoglobulin, immunofluorescence, and the harms all together, it is clear that is 100% post-streptococcal glonophytes. And this is the only glonophytes classically is demonstrated even today, but not in other cases. However, in SLE, they are very close to it. And in membranous nephropathy, they are also close to diagnose the antibodies. So treatment of PHGN, I am not going uh, detail over here. You all of you know, uh, I said everything. And nephrotic syndrome in minimal change. The 85% of the children had minimal change disease. And most of them does not have any microscopic or macroscopic hematuria. So they should be treated with that is a minimal change disease and they should be treated with 60 milligram per square meter per day for six weeks nowadays, not four weeks, and then reduce the dose to one third and then again to give every alternate day for another six weeks. So this is a form of treatment to treat for uh, 12 weeks treatment. That is the recommended by the International Society of Kidney Disease in Children and also KDOCI as well, in even to the recent years. <clears throat> so if there is a second relapse, you have to go for same treatment and first relapse. And in third relapse, you go to the same form of treatment as in first relapse, but the duration of steroid in usually second, first and second relapse, usually not with six weeks treatment, but as long, as soon as the remission of the proteinuria, either by three weeks or by four weeks, then add more, one more weeks, and then reduce the dose of the uh, prednisolone. That is the difference between first and relapse. But in the third relapse, you have to use the cyclophosphamide, which is usually they say if there is no side effects, give to 12 weeks, that is three months. But if there is a side effect like leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, you should uh, reduce the dose or stop the dose until and unless WBC count is more than 5,000. So therefore, be careful that every patient receiving cyclophosphamide in children with nephrotic syndrome, you request the patient to come to your chamber every month or give explain that your WBC count can be low and you have to stop the drug. Do not continue with other will be dangerous infection and patient may even die with leukopenia. And after this third relapse, uh, still when we say that it is a steroid dependent or steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome would not remit neither with uh, steroid nor with cyclophosphamide, then nowadays the, the practicing is to give cyclosporine or tectolimus. I usually treat with tectolimus that is easier for me because we can do the tectonic level as well. That is 0 0.1 milligram per kg per body weight for eight weeks and then graduate taper and continue for one year. When you give, uh, uh, do not go up beyond eight, eight milligram 
uh, tacrolimus level, other is it will cause toxic effect. And so when you see for first three months, you maintain six to eight milligram, uh, that is tacrolimus blood level, but after three months, reduced it to four to five milligram level of tacrolimus and continue this four to five milligram for one year. Some of these people and in some country, I know that because of the steroid dependent, they even they goes up to the one and a half years, but the kid of the guidelines say that you should continue with uh, one year and then stop the drug. So that is about the minimal nephrotic syndrome. So, but in adult, but in adult it is very different. In adult, minimal chance is given one milligram per kg per day or two milligram per kg every alternate day. And duration is four weeks to 16 weeks, depending on the remission of proteinuria in adult. And then you taper five to 10 to 14 milligram every two weeks to a to and to reduce or stop the drug in six months' time. And that is the adult. The adult is not six weeks, six weeks. It is close to six months, can be extended up to one year. Then, therefore, uh, when to use mycophonolate mofetil in adult steroid? If there is a relapse, with steroid in minimal change in adults, it is almost similar to that of the children, but many people think, or many author thinks, that mycophonolate mofetil can also continue with or without steroid and can continue for one year or two years. The supportive therapy in nephrotic syndrome statin, even if it is a raise of uh, steroid, do not use statin. Because the nephrotic syndrome who received the steroid, they are already myopet, uh, they have already weakness of the limbs. So therefore, you cannot make more weak for the patient by giving statin. So please be careful to use it in a nephrotic syndrome or chronic Clonephritis. You must consider this effect that this group of drugs always received steroid in the past and they have already have myopathy as well as. So, FSGS, as I say, that uh, it is usually nephrotic syndrome in origin, microscopic hemorrhage, maybe in one third cases, hypertension and renal failure is also present and glomerulosclerosis you can see in this slide, small almost completely sclerosed lobules, and you can see a lot of sclerosis over this glomeruli, and this treatment is like that of minimal change. The only exception, their duration is four to 16 weeks as tolerated or as that of remission. If there is a Eight weeks remission, you are lucky. If there is a 12 weeks remission, you are still lucky. The full dose is given up to eight, four to 16 weeks. That is the problem. After remission, you have the dose and then taper slowly with complete remission. The CNI can be considered if there is a steroid psychosis, osteoporosis, development of diabetes mellitus. <clears throat> and steroid resistant FSGS, if it does not respond with the steroid, then you can use cyclosporin or tacrolimus as in minimal change disease for four to six months minimum, and then reduce the dose, slowly tap out, monitor blood level, and continue for 12 months. Mycophonate mofetil can be used with dextromethacin if they are untolerable to diet of the steroid, but the results are not satisfactory. 
the if there is a nephrotic syndrome of more than 10 gram there is a tubular interstitial disease elevated serum creatinine at presentation increased low molecular protein in urine like beta 2 microglobulin these are not response to steroid and they create a lot of problem in patient who has very uh, much proteinuria like 8 to 10 gram Memorous nephropathy, as you know, that is, is usually in 70 to 80% as primary, secondary is 15 to 20%. The primary glonephrite is not memorous nephropathy, respond to steroid. And therefore, you use steroid uh, after seeing the memorous nephropathy, how the capillary basement membrane is thickened over here immunophorase and showing the IgG, IgA, IgM antibody and electron microscopy, you can see the spike formation. So, treatment of membranous nephropathy initially should be started when protein is more than 4 gram or more than 3 gram when there is obvious edema. Because fortunately, uh, this membranous nephropathy with symptomatic treatment goes into remission in at least 20 to 30 percent cases. So, give them some time for spontaneous remission for one year. Then, if the protein is more than 4 gram, you should start with, as said by the kid of the guideline, there are two steps of treatment you can use six monthly course of alternating monthly cyclophosphamide with oral iv corticosteroid and oral alkalizing agent so there are two for form so i i usually use for the sake of the patient Usually give them one milligram per kg body weight prednisolone along with cyclophosphamide, both are tablet. I do not use this corticosteroid, IV corticosteroid in every steps because it is difficult. The patient does not uh, um, come to the time because uh, if we give them one month to come every time, they usually respond not well. So, for their response, I make it much more easier. So, I use this steroid, 1 milligram per kg body weight for about one half to two months. Then gradually taper the dose, 10 to 4, 14 milligram every two weeks and reduce in six months and stop the drug along with cyclophosphamide but we instruct the patient to come every one to two months to see the leukopenia as well if the patient does not respond with two times then i use the tacrolimus for the patient but be sure that if the gfr is less than 30 do not use any cyclophosphamide, steroid, or any of the drug because they do not, they will have more harmful effect rather than good. So steroid and cyclophosphamide should be used only with normal kidney function. That is serum creatinine is stage one and stage two, but not in stage three. The, <clears throat> all these CNI, and this uh, other drugs as in minimal chance on focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, so it does not need to be added. Prophylactic anticoagulant, if there is a edema, if there is a nephrotic transproteinuria, you can use aspirin as well when you use cyclophosphamide, or if you do not use, even aspirin should be used so that our warfarin is very difficult, but, but I think 
in that case <coughs> of the uh, recent uh, drugs which we use uh, and that will be much more easier than use warfarin because in warfarin you have to see the protein time every month as well so spontaneous emission as i said before membranoproliferative glomerulonephrite is very difficult to treat i do not think that uh, will give much more importance to treat uh, glomerulonephrite but uh, the kedoki guidelines said give low dose steroid if the kidney function test is normal but once that the, there is a slow rising of the serum creatinine you can use my phonolate mofetil as well as steroid low dose but it is prolonged use <clears throat> idiopathic mpgn the similar as diet of the uh, membrane of polyparative nephritis igenephropathy here uh, i think you will have much more uh, as uh, when to use steroid if they put if there is a less than 1 gram protein urea start with a cnrb which is always said like that but if it is more than 1 gram to 1.5 gram or even 2 gram and normal kidney function you can use steroid they say only steroid the steroid and cyclophosphamide the literature which is shown by the indian authors they say that also respond but i usually use steroid alone for two months and then gradually taper and continue for six months some respond some other do not respond <coughs> mycophonate mofetil can be a useful drug when there is a rise of serum creatinine rapidly rising can give mycophonate mofetil and nowadays some authors say that they responded well and it should be given only hematuria no proteinuria so no steroid the <coughs> then other treatment rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis as i say if you form find the crescent for more than 50 percent uncasuistic vasculitis you can use methylprednisolone followed by oral prednisolone cyclophosphamide antibiotic therapy if depend on if it is a post-treptococcal uh, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis some say you can use it plasmapheresis does not do any good nowadays as say mycophonate mofetil is useful as in iv monoglobulin so but if you like to treat it treat within two weeks of detection of this uh, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis after two weeks when there is sclerosis and fibrosis it will not be responded so only make it very toxic with some drugs the my last part is side effect of immunosuppressive drugs we know the side effect of steroid is fluid retention and edema it can cause diabetes it can cause high blood pressure it is very dangerous to have susceptible to infection steroid psychosis and peptic ulcer is always known long time is cataract avascular necrosis of the bone and growth retardations, particularly in children. Side effect of cytotoxic drugs, you know, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, bone marrow depression, gonadal suppression, alopecia, cancer, and avascular necrosis. So, ladies and gentlemen, the doctors who are we were here, uh, uh, steroid is the treatment of choice in patient with MCN, FSGS, only steroid, I say. Treatment of frequent relapse and steroid resistant, minimal changes, and FSGS, a steroid with cyclophosphamide or tacrolimus. And I am not, I are, I do not use plumbusil, but authors say that steroid plumbusil, steroid cyclophosphamide, is the treatment of choice in medicine property. And thank you very much.
for patient hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, thank you very much.